insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights in Entertainment. This is episode 117. Disney isn't number one. We're not number one. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my lovely and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Aww. How are you doing today, dear? Hot. Yes, How are it you? Is. <laughs> it's, uh, computer says it is 90 degrees outside. Yeah. The inside temperature in the studio right now is 77.5. It's gone up three degrees since I started setting up for the podcast. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> it's uncomfortable. Another heat wave again, but yeah. yeah, well, it is what it is. So in today in our Disney detective, we're going to talk about the fact that Disney isn't number one, according to fans anymore. And then some unhappy guests burst into song while stuck on a popular ride. In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, an actor from The Mandalorian says why season three will be more like season one and the completed Star Wars show that we'll never probably see. And for our entertainment news, Kevin Feige reportedly is not pleased with Disney's uh, with Disney over their release strategy for Black Pan uh, Black Panther, right? <laughs> Black Widow. Uh, we did Black Panther last week's story, right? Right. And a Willy Wonka child star said this actor made sure she was looked after on set because her parents weren't around during filming. Very nice story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. And we'll have an abbreviated version of our afterthoughts as well. Ready to get started? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So our first story comes from InsideTheMagic.net, and it talks about how fans don't think that Disney theme parks are number one in the U.S. anymore. So obviously there's popularity surrounding Disney and all of its theme parks, and it's you know easy for people to consider them number one uh, in the United States. But however, a recent poll that was actually conducted by USA Today revealed that that is far from the case. So it seems USA Today asked its readers to vote on their favorite theme park as well as their favorite roller coaster in the United States. Now, Disney almost didn't make the cut uh, when it came to a fan favorite theme park, and it also... Um, and it didn't rank in the top 10 when it came to roller coasters. Instead, another Florida theme park took the number one honor when it came to both categories. And kind of shockingly, it was SeaWorld Orlando. So SeaWorld actually took to social media to share the exciting news to all its followers, saying, breaking news, you voted and the results are in. We won not one but two incredible awards. SeaWorld Orlando and Mako have been voted the number one amusement park and number one roller coaster by USA Today's uh, at uh, 10 Best Readers Choice Awards. So not only was SeaWorld Orlando ranked number one for the amusement park, but their roller coaster was named number one as well. Uh, so Mako is the tallest, fastest roller coaster in Orlando, reaching speeds of 73 miles per hour and a height of 200 feet. Hate to say it, but I don't care because <laughs> there's no way I'd be going on that anyway. But... um so, uh, you know, so while Disney nor Universal Orlando took the number one spot, they did both make appearances on the list. Disney World's Magic Kingdom theme park ranked number nine on the best theme parks list, and Hagrid's Magical Creature 
motorbike adventure took the number 10 spot on the best roller coasters. So in order to determine a top theme park and top roller coaster, a panel of experts at USA Today created an initial list of nominees for more than 400 theme parks and hundreds of roller coasters. Readers were then asked to vote on their top 10, and that's how they came up with their final list. So the only objection that I have to this is that there aren't 400 theme parks. There are tons of amusement parks. Right. So the fact that you're clear, and I'm not saying this in, in the defense of, mm-hmm. of Disney or no, no. Universal at all, but to classify a theme park like Disney in the same realm as an amusement park like a Six Flags, they're completely different types I of parks. I completely agree. They're targeted for completely different audiences. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and well, I don't think anybody ever expected Disney to come in the top in roller coasters because the roller coasters are family friendly roller coasters. Right. Right. They don't have breakneck, super high, super fast, super long, nothing. It's they're pretty team roller coasters when it comes to the world of roller coasters. Right. When you look at because, it, again, it's meant to be an attraction. Right. Right. Um, you know, that's one of the things there's somebody um, who I follow actually now on TikTok. He's a cast member he does a lot of the emceeing events that they they do online and and stuff like that and he actually talked about one and um you know one of the the you know kind of easter eggy type things is that like when you enter the magic kingdom and you kind of walk through the tunnel the idea is supposed to feel like you're at a movie premiere and all the posters that you're seeing are the coming attractions, and that's why all of their – they're not called rides. They're called attractions, and that's right. what they they really are. Like, yes, there are some that are thrill rides but even or the thrill, thrill attractions. But team compared right. to uh, oh, some absolutely. of the crazy roller coasters absolutely. out Absolutely. You know, the slingshot rides and the roller coasters that, you know, take you up – and you know, go backwards. Yes, yeah. totally, totally agree. It, it's it, it's really two different, you know, um, genres. Really, you yeah, have they're, the they're for different audiences, right? You know, I would not classify Hershey Park, you know, or or Six Flags like you said with Disney. You yeah. know, like if and, I wanted, and that's the thing. Like a theme park is an immersive experience. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to Orlando, Universal Orlando, Mm -hmm. you're going for the Harry Potter experience or whatever. Right. You go to Disney, you're going for the Disney experience or the Star Wars experience or the Animal Kingdom, whatever it is. Right, right. It's themed. It's there to immerse you and to keep you occupied. Everything keeps you occupied. Right. Whereas you go to a Six Flags and you're going there for the rides. Mm Mm-hmm. And and that's really what you're there for. Right. Even SeaWorld. Like, what what is, aside from being sea themed right because they've got aquariums and they paint their roller coasters blue right like yeah i've never actually been it's to an amusement that's an amusement park know, to me and, and you know what i could almost up it a little a little bit higher quality than you know a, a a local theme park right but i don't know i i and I don't know, maybe there are people that are like diehard SeaWorld fans, well, you know. And, and, and I'm sure they are. But right. I guess my point is that it's, to me, it's not a theme park. It's an amusement park. Right. You're now not going I there could, for the immersive experience. Right. And I could see doing a strictly roller coaster, you know, because Six Flags has their New Jersey Devil and there's. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. You know, and the, there are tons of roller the, coaster rated um, list in What? The, Cedar Creek? Not Cedar Creek. I um, can't think of the, the. You know, there's all these like amusement parks that have been around for like. Yeah, you, you got know, Kings Island, you right. got Kings Dominion, you got Knobles, you have all these right ro- who have these you know wooden roller coasters right. and you know these uh, no, roller even, coaster even Coney Island you know? right you know these roller coaster uh, enthusiasts who you know they have their own list of right. there are people that vacation and travel around to right do roller just coasters. to do you know so nobody's going to Disney for a roller coaster experience so right I hate to I, break it to you. I'm going for the haunted mansion but that's just yeah, right. That's so <laughs> I have to question mm-hmm. 
the methodology in which they did this, it clearly wasn't a particularly scientific one, especially since their editors right. pick the 400 and then ask people and to And then said, out of these 400s, which, which did you like? Right. So, eh. As much as I don't have a problem busting on Disney and, and, and giving them digs when they deserve it, right. I don't think they deserve the bad press on this one here. Right, right. So, anyway, w- what they might deserve bad press on is when you actually get on a ride, but it doesn't and work. And you're stuck. Let's talk about that. One. <laughs> so this story also comes from Inside the Magic. Um, you know, so obviously when somebody is planning a trip to Walt Disney World, it hopefully will be one of the most magical trips that a person will take. And of course, you have, you know, at the Walt Disney World Resort, you have the Magic Kingdom and Epcot and Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom and, you know, the various water parks and then the shopping district and everything. Um You know, so you would hope that things go smoothly on your trip, but obviously things happen, you know, just like anything else. Things break down, people get, you know, uh, things get stuck. Um, And this is actually what had happened. So um, there was a bunch of people that were on a ride, and unfortunately the ride got stuck to the point where most of the guests were stuck for about 20 minutes until they could get these guests, the cast members could get them off. Um, but somebody had actually shared a video on TikTok, and the video shows a group of guests who were stuck on the mine train um, while singing a Neil Diamond classic. So the user also shared some key information saying that I think we waited for about 20 minutes. We had some young ladies who threw on some music from their phone and it kind of lightened the mood. Um, they're the ones that really deserve the credit. They got the party started. It, you know, quickly turned from ever being fr- frustrated to something very funny where everybody started singing Sweet Caroline while waiting on the ride. So that's where you kind of, you know, you take a a bad time and you kind of turn it into something new. Um, So obviously... um, one of the things that one of the things that they do is when guests get stuck on rides, they'll usually try and compensate you uh, for the time that you were there by giving you some sort of uh, fast pass that can be used on pretty much any ride at any time to kind of make up for it. Um, so the, they had mentioned in the article that they were giving out the fast passes that they could be used for a single turn just on anything. That wasn't Peter Pan for some reason, but everybody had a good time and nobody was hurt, obviously, which is a good thing. Just inconvenienced by the ride breaking down, which it happens. Well, and we've had situations where we've been on rides that have gotten stuck Mm -hmm. or they've slowed the ride. Uh, A lot of times if it's a continuous loop ride, they'll slow them to allow... um, Handicapped folks to right, get on to and get off on the and ride. get off. Right. Uh, or if it's busy, you know, we've been mm-hmm. on parts of the Caribbean where we've been backed up in the boat queue <laughs> right. for 15, 20 minutes at right, a Right, right. Which isn't um, so bad because you're in air conditioning. So Right. And <laughs> and the one ride we never really have a problem getting stuck on is Haunted Mansion. Right. And we've had that happen a few times. I had it happen one time when we were going backwards down the thing. Mm, so. I did too. It was kind of like a nice little nap. Right. Yeah, that's so. definitely one I never mind getting stuck. I'm like, you could just leave me for like five hours. I'd be and it's like snacks. The best place <laughs> that I've ever gotten stuck was on Haunted Mansion in the seance room. Yes. That was a good place to get stuck. Or right during the ballroom scene. Yeah. Anywhere in the ballroom yeah, scene. Some place where you nice. got a good view. And, and we weren't stuck for very long. No, usually just a uh, couple of I minutes. I never been evacuated from a ride there maddie and i were evacuated from winnie the pooh i remember okay. that we had, and we were actually almost towards the end we were in like the heffalumpin woozles okay. section and we had to walk out so that one was kind of like oh really this is where we get to walk out like it yeah. wasn't like something like Ooh. Now, we've been on the people mover when mm-hmm. Space Mountain has been shut down and lit up, which is kind of neat. Yeah, that's a that's a nice little bonus treat. Right. You know, when right. you get to see that because most, you know, 99% of the time it's, it's, it's pitch black it's in there. It's pitch black and you can't see anything. Yeah. So on those rare occasions where the lights are on, it, it's like, oh, 
We did have that one year we went down and we had Sam with us, and Sam was on three rides that <laughs> broke down. Three rides he was on the poor kid. <laughs> three rides broke down, and then one ride broke down as he was standing in line to get onto it. Right, right. Uh, so that was a rough that was a rough yeah uh, the trip for one him. time we got stuck before we even made it on test track it was Maddie Sam and I and they ended up giving us fast passes right. for a return uh you know but then we also had an instance and this is one of our favorite instances of of stuck was we were doing a photo right, right. uh a photo the op disney visa photo op disney visa photo op you, you they'd have they used to have this special area where you could go show your visa card and they usually had like one or two characters um you know and you would get a free photo with it and as soon as we got in Something happened with the cast member's camera. Right. And we weren't even first. They had gone through a couple of Right. They had already. gone through a bunch of other families. And by the time they got to us, they were like, hey, we have to change out the cameras. You're already in here. Whatever. And I don't know, like 15 minutes. It was easily 15 It was easily minutes. 15 minutes. And we and the characters were still in there. Like the characters didn't go off stage. Yeah. They stayed and played Duck, Duck, Goose. Right. Duck, Duck, Goose and hide and seek hide and with our seek. daughter. It was, and it was... It was incredible. That was probably our most favorite. Like, at that point, we didn't even care if we got a picture yeah. because we were taking pictures like crazy with the characters playing with her. Right, right. And taking video and stuff. So, you know, sometimes when you have those stuck moments, yeah. they turn out to be kind yeah. of magical. And, so. and that's what I like about this story. It was the, the people on the ride... Kind of made the best of the moment. Right. Like, hey, we're here. We're stuck. What are we going to do? Right. Let's do a sing along. And then you get off the ride and, you know, they give you your fast passes. Right. So that that was that was kind of a cool story. Yeah. Yeah. So that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So our first story comes from thedirect.com, and it talks about how while the MCU has been cranking out, you know, we're up to now three Disney Plus uh, series on Disney Plus, Star Wars fans are kind of still looking to, you know, what's the future of The Mandalorian's third season? So the first ever live action Star Wars series obviously was a massive hit. It established Baby Yoda as a pop culture phenomenon because, of do, course, do, he's do, 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 do. <laughs> <Menomenal. laughs> Cause of course he's located all over the place here. Uh, and season two blew our minds like a Christmas miracle with Luke Skywalker making a cameo uh, in this episode's final revealed, um, you know, subversive uh fan expectation in a different way so and then of course you had the post credit scene in the star wars you know uh that showed the new project of the book of boba fett which obviously let us know that you know mando season three wasn't going to be the next thing coming so this kind of left everybody wondering what the future held for the mandalorian and obviously what was going to happen with Grogu since at the end of the season he left with Luke. Spoilers. Um, so in the Star Wars Sessions podcast, the Mandalorian stunt double 
uh, Brendan Wayne, who happens to be John Wayne's grandson, which I thought that was kind of, you know, an interesting little thing, um, had a few things to share about what fans can expect from the eventual third season. Um, and he kind of said that there would be a lot less introductions and it, they would kind of delve deeper into the character. So we know that leading actor Pedro Pascal provides the voice of Mando, um, but a lot of the movements and and the mannerisms, we actually it's actually Brendan that we see uh, doing a lot of that. Um, so he's, you know, largely responsible for creating the stature and, and like I said, the mannerisms. So when he was asked about the third season, you know, was it going to be bigger than both season one and two? He, he kind of shared his thoughts and he said, I think we've introduced the world in which Mando now exists, exists now. Not that there are going to be a lot of new things. He says, I think there's going to be a lot less introductions and a lot more going back towards the first season of delving deeper into the character and things like that. Um, you know, when we left Mando at the end of season two, he was now in possession of the dark saber and he had just separated from Grogu. Uh, the episode ended before, you know, he had time to process either event, not to mention that his own Mandalorian belief system had now kind of went, <laughs> you know, mind blowing, like, what do I do now? Um, and then of course, Grogu leaving off with Luke Skywalker. So how is that going to change? Um, so they had asked him, you know, have you, you know, have you heard things? You know, did you, have you read any of the scripts? And he said, no. Well, have you heard some things? And he said, yeah, you know, but I can only, you know, kind of assume where they're going. You know, right now the storytelling is, is it's John, you know, Favreau's story. So however he wants to lead the story, um, you know, so obviously there are speculations that, you know, John Favreau and Dave Filoni have plans to see the galaxy's favorite father figure even earlier than that. Um, you know, so now you have Boba Fett and that whole story. Um, it seems that there was a leaked T-shirt of the crew from the book of Boba Fett that shows a little Grogu in the artwork. So does that mean that Mando will have another adventure or two in, you know, book of Boba Fett? Is he going to kind of just stay in the back and then you'll just wait to see him in the Mandalorian? So a lot of speculation, you know, nothing really concrete, but obviously we know that we're not getting the the third season yet because Book of Boba Fett is going to come first. Well, and I have to say, it's kind of a, a relief to hear this because you figure you had they tried to spawn three different shows mm -hmm. out of last season. True, true. We're only going to get two out of it at this point. But it was it was too much. Like, right. It, it, it was almost like all the guest spots overshadowed mm -hmm. The Mandalorian. Right. And it wasn't like The Mandalorian season two. It was like everyone else and The Mandalorian season right. two. Here's all our cameos of what you can see later on, right. so, okay. not in The Mandalorian. We need to get an Ahsoka show. Let's get her in there. Right. Uh, we need to get a Boba Fett show. Let's do that. Uh, we need to do uh, Rangers of the Republic. Let's do those guys. Right. And it was like every show, these people were were appearing, but they weren't really lending a whole lot mm -hmm. to the overall plot of the season. Right. I could definitely see them kind of going back towards you know, a season one mentality, give us a little bit more history about how he came to be. Like, Absolutely. you know, they always show these little, uh, you know, flashbacks of things with his parents and, you know, you know, let's, let's see his teenage years. Let's see, you know, him, him growing up and, yeah. and dealing with the other Mandalorians and being accepted and, and, and doing all of that. So, so a question came up today on uh, Twitter. I think it was on Star Wars feed or something like okay. that. Okay. What gave you more goosebumps, Vader at the end of Rogue One or Skywalker at the end of season two of Mando? <sighs> My answer was more goosebumps for Vader, more tears for Luke. Because mm. it was a very emotional. Yes experience i i definitely yeah i i would say goosebumps equal goosebumps 
But yes, I definitely cried when I when I all of a sudden realized it was Luke. Yeah. And I was And it was like, a much longer sequence than Vader got too. Yes. But definitely the shock and awe of Vader where I know you were like, Yeah, Vader you were cheering him. I was like, No, he's gonna kill people <laughs> you know, but it was still like, dude, he's a bad a yeah, um yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah yeah i thought that was a really good question that is a good question that is a so, good one i like that so uh, let's take a little detour <laughs> on the topic today. that was good uh this was actually a, a story that we had brought up a couple of weeks back but it happened to to pop up again um you know so disney this uh comes from sci-fi.com uh, so Disney Plus may be the home of all kinds of new Star Wars content from space westerns like The Mandalorian. Now you have, uh, you know, the Bad Batch animated series. Um, but don't expect the long shelved animated series Star Wars Detours to be joining the lineup anytime soon. So series creator uh, Seth Green had actually told Entertainment Weekly that despite Star Wars creator George Lucas's involvement in the project, and the completion of 39 finished broadcast ready episodes it has basically been shelved indefinitely interesting fact is that uh seth green actually voiced is it toto sure we're going uh that. 360 who was a techno service droid uh on a recent episode of bad batch uh, he said, we finished the episodes almost 10 years ago, and so there would be a bit of, you know, reconfiguring of the existing stuff to make something that Disney Plus would release as a Lucasfilm offering. Um, but all that way, you know, it's been explained to me that there just hasn't been enough interest high enough up to go through that. Um, you know, that it would take to, you know, what it would take to put it out, that there's just not an interest of releasing the content on Disney Plus from Lucasfilms. So Star Wars Detours, um, as we had talked about before, was announced actually back in 2012 at Star Wars Celebration and would have been another partnership between Lucasfilm Animation and Robot Chicken. Um, Matt uh, Senrick and Seth Green following the studio's three Star Wars specials, which of, you know, each of them, you know, were lovingly lampooning the franchise. Um, so the episodes were roughly about six minutes long in length. If you're a fan of Robot Chicken, that's about what each, you know, episode was um, for, for that. And there are 62 more episodes that were written and were awaiting animation. But unfortunately, before it could make it to air, Disney bought Lucasfilms and decided to go in a different direction, focusing on the sequel trilogy, as well as more uh, serious animated series design to explain and build out the universe further, rather than continuing to poke fun at it. And Seth actually said, you know what, I really don't have an emotional position because I got to spend four straight years making something with George Lucas. Uh, he said, my partner and I and all the other people that got to work on it, the artists, the actors and directors and animators, we all got to make something Star Wars with the guy who created it. Um, and so I know over those four years that, you know, he was having fun and that's what I really care about. I got a priceless, ex a priceless experience with one of my truest heroes and got to see him laugh and enjoy all the things that he had created in a time before he agreed to sell them all to somebody else. Uh, Green also went on to say, it's not that I don't care if people never see it. It's just that it's ultimately doesn't matter if nobody ever sees it because nobody can take that away from any of us. And that's the kind of thing that would never happen again. And I realize it. Um, you know, Lucas wasn't the only big name who was working on the project. You had Billy D. Williams and Anthony Daniels and Ahmed Best, who lent their voices to the projects, uh, along with Zachary uh, Levi, Weird Al Yankovic, uh, Zeth McFarlane, uh, and Felicia Day. So it's kind of a shame when you have all these people involved with it. But I think, you know, again, kind of like Seth said, we had so much fun doing it. They can't take it away right, from us. Right. You know, the, the experience, it's just kind of a shame that, 
you know. Well, and like, <laughs> you know, I love the, the robot chicken mm-hmm. episodes. I thought yep. they were hilarious. I even like the Family Guy ones. Mm-hmm. But I think part of the problem that Disney had was an image issue with it because right. you <laughs> literally were endorsing people making fun of it. Mm-hmm. And I think anything that Disney wants to go in that direction with, they're going to do it in a more controlled fashion. Right. In a more family-friendly fashion. Because the robot chicken right. stuff was not really family-friendly. Oh, absolutely. I could see it, you know, like the Lego Star Wars stuff. And that's stuff. what I was that's, getting at, is that Star, you know. You know that's where they do uh, their Disney goes. Cheek. Disney goes with the Lego stuff because mm-hmm. it's all directed at kids. We can have fun with it. We can play around with it and make jokes, you know. And we love those, too. Mm-hmm. Um so, like, I understand why Disney didn't go with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the sense of humor that that he has with the other projects mm-hmm. can get a little raunchy, right? And it's just not something that Disney. You know, you look at all the other stuff that Disney's pulling the plug on for for things that for are not others, family right. friendly. Yeah, at least they're consistent. I'll give them credit for right. consistency. It's a shame to see that much work go to waste. Absolutely, it's it's not like oh, we did like five episodes. Like it should you be, know? it should be there should be a bootleg version of it released yes. like the Star Wars, the original holiday special. I, and that's exactly what I was thinking is that I hope somewhere down the line, ten years from now, five years yeah. from now, somebody manages to. Get a copy of it, and you can buy it on eBay. Yeah, you know, and you That's, get the bootleg copy. Uh, that, I think I think fans deserve to see it, mm-hmm. and they'll appreciate it, but not mm-hmm. through traditional Disney right. channels. Right, right. So that was all we had for our tales from the edge of the galaxy. Yeah. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. for entertainment news. So our first story comes from wegotitthiscovered.com and it seems at you know at long last Black Widow is now less than 2 days away from being released. Uh you know given its numerous delays over the past year Marvel fans had become increasingly desperate to see the movie and had been demanding it drop on Disney Plus and forego a theatrical run. But as it happened, Disney elected to release it in both the cinemas and on streaming, with Scarlett Johansson uh, vehicle being available to watch online through Disney Plus's premier access label this Friday. So audiences, you know, are hungry to watch the film from the comfort of their own home and are less eager, you know, to stream it then. Um, But it sounds like Marvel Studios themselves are less than happy about the arrangement. So according to tipster Daniel uh, Rickman, Marvel's president, uh, Kevin Feige, is not at all pleased with Disney over their uh, revised Black Widow release strategy. In fact, the scooper had said that he was actually mad with the studio for releasing it on streaming and in the theaters at the same time. So the reason why is because he was apparently not told about it and wasn't personally involved in the decision to put Black Widow out on Disney+. Plus. Um, so if the intel is correct, it would be very surprising. Say because uh, Feiji is one of Disney's most lucrative partners, and he's brought them billions upon billions of dollars over the past decade. Um, 
you would have thought that they would have kept him, you know, in the loop that they were doing this with one of his own productions. However, this sort of snub is key, is kind of in keeping with the outrage that we've actually heard from other filmmakers over their movies getting put out on the streaming release. Pixar seems to be uh, kind of mad as well with Disney for repeatedly sharing their efforts for free on Disney+. Plus. Um, and then, of course, you have... Um, you know, other uh, creative uh, m- uh, movies that have been coming out um, that, you know, have kind of been hitting against Warner Brothers media uh, and films that have been showing on HBO Max. You had the Christopher Nolan movie uh, and, a, and a whole bunch of other movies that have been coming out since, what, the beginning of the year and have been only on uh HBO Max. Now some of them are are in theaters as well. Um, So obviously as studios are kind of adjusting to the changing cinematic landscape, it definitely seems like they're struggling to keep both movie makers and the moviegoers happy at the same time. Um, So obviously whether or not he's happy or not, Black Widow can be found in theaters and on Disney Plus for $29.99 uh, additional charge starting this Friday. So I'll give you three guesses on why he's not happy, and we'll see if you hit on the reason that I'm I'm thinking. He's not making money. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'll guarantee you that he has bonuses that kick in at certain box office levels, and Absolutely. he's not going to see those bonuses come out because – they're not going to pull in those numbers. Mm-hmm. And I'll guarantee you, knowing Disney, as cheap as they are, they're not going to count any of the membership purchases through Disney Plus towards that number either. Mm. So Disney, who's already got a reputation for stiffing you know, writers and other people that True. have worked for mm-hmm. them, is really found a way that they can make these multi-million dollar movies where they can suck the money in through Disney Plus mm-hmm. and not have to pay on their promises, their contracted promises to the talent that they have that are making these things. Right. And I'll guarantee you, you're going to see that same kind of problem with um, uh, your actors as well. Right. And we know that Robert Downey Jr. brought in $66 million, more than half of that. Because his salary was, I think, twenty million. Right. The rest of that were bonuses based on what the box office numbers mm-hmm. were. Right. So if a Robert Downey Jr. is going to get stiffed on box office bonuses because you're going to release it on Disney uh, Plus at the same time, how how much of this talent do you really think Disney's going to have to pull from at that point mm-hmm. in time? If you're going to continue to stiff your actors, right? Disney's going to be making their money, mm-hmm. and this is a this is a problem that they're going to have moving forward because you're going to have people like. Like Feige here, who's who's literally made the company more money than any single person in the history of the company. And when you look at just the MCU right. movies, right? Yeah, he's made the company more money, <clears throat> and they're going to piss him off to the point that he's going to go somewhere else. How stupid is that from a business standpoint? Yeah. So again, it's Disney doing it wrong every time. Almost every chance they have. To do the right thing, they deliberately choose to do it wrong. It's amazing that they're as successful as they are with that kind of strategy. So here's a question. Do you feel that they shouldn't be streaming it? I don't think. I think you should probably have a four-week period where it's only in the theaters. Right now, it's a three. it used to be a three-month period. Mm-hmm. I think you can cut that down, have, a, have it release earlier on stream, but you have to have that mega box open box uh, opening weekend at the box office. Mm-hmm. You need to have those those couple of weeks there where that's where the exclusivity is. Mm-hmm. So you're screwing your studios, you're screwing your actors, you're screwing your your directors and you're you're screwing everybody who's right. involved in in this success. But the thing is 6 months ago you couldn't do that. I agree. So what we ran into was a workaround. What's right. happening is you can go to the theaters now. Right. And they are simultaneously releasing in both. Mm-hmm. So the question is, why? And the answer is, because it's more lucrative for them. Well, and the other thing, too, is not everybody has Disney+. Plus. A lot of people don't. Right. But there are still people that, that don't. Right. But for but 30 are... bucks, the 10 people on our street that don't have it can come over and watch it with us. Right. But that's that's the thing is, you know, and there are people who enjoy the atmosphere of going to the movie. Let me ask you a question. Are we mm-hmm. going to the theater to watch this? 
I don't know. Are we? No, we're not. Okay, we're, we're gonna, not. We're going to get this on Disney Plus, or we're going to wait the six months for it to come out for free and not I pay for it at wait all. Six months. I didn't want to wait six months for Milan, but we did. It wasn't six months, wasn't it? Three. It was however long it took for it to come out free. No, because when it did finally come out free, we still didn't watch. We right. We waited even longer. We waited even longer because we had everything else going on. Right, but. So I, we're I not going to pay the money to go see this because Disney's not making us. Okay. But I mean, that's what I'm. Th- you know, sure. you have to give you have to right. give the talent a chance to make the money off. Of true. It. True. Now, but, if Disney wants to come out and pay Robert Downey Jr. his sixty six million for Avengers and right. still release it on Disney Plus. More power to him for that. Right. But the thing is, the movie's also been done for over a year, too, and just sitting there not making anybody any money. So so why didn't they release it on Disney Plus earlier? Because clearly they weren't waiting for the okay from Faggy to release it. Right. Yeah. Well, so it's a money yeah, because they knew they course. could make more money by releasing it in theaters and on Disney Plus at the same time. They're trying to get their cake and eat it, too. Mm. And in the process, they're rubbing cake in everybody else's faces that that gave him the ability to make the money. Right. Whereas you have, you know, poor Pixar who, you All know, their stuff is getting released. All of their stuff is getting released for free. Yep. There's nothing that, you know, that they've had where, you know, yep. it's a premiere. It's all, hey, this is out. Enjoy. Yeah. So I don't know what the contracts look like there. Yeah. We know that the Marvel Cinematic Universe people involved in that are getting bonuses for box office numbers. Right. So they're going to piss off their talent. They're not going to have it. And then you're going to go through a dark period where Disney's not going to be able to make a decent movie. It's going to be like the 80s all over again. Mm, I don't know, because they have so many different things that are up and coming. I, I could I could see them, you know, I, I could see that whole two-month, three-month thing. Now it's available on streaming. So. Yeah, and, and I would even say a month mm-hmm. because most movies that are box, box office blockbusters – you don't hear too much about after the first month. Right. It's your opening day, your opening weekend, your opening week, and then whatever you get, you know, residuals for the rest of the month there. Right, right. The only time you heard about anything more than that was when you had Avengers mm-hmm. where they wanted to break the Avatar record. Right. So they, they re-released it multiple times and kind of cheated the system to do that. But then they also re-released Avatar to kind of get back right. at them too. Right. So. Oh, and they're all owned by Disney, so it was kind of like. Right. But my point is, is that <laughs> right. after that first month, it doesn't matter because the bulk of your money's been made. Right, and the majority of the people are going and seeing it a second or third or fourth or fifth time. Right. You know, by that point. So that's where I could see that model okay. going, not the simultaneous release. Sure. Okay. So tell us about Willy Wonka. So this was a, a really sweet story. So uh, Willy Wonka actually just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Uh, it was actually last week um, that it, it had hit its milestone. So this was a, a story that actually came out um, that uh, Julie uh, Dawn Cole, who played... Um, Veruca Salt. Veruca, sorry, um, had talked about how... <clears throat> excuse me um you know gene wilder was just you know such a loving person so it seemed that she along with some other co-stars uh peter orstrom who played charlie bucket um michael Bol- Bol- bolner who played augustus and paris thelman who pay- played mike tv spoke about the late wilder in a conversation with insider to mark the film's 50th anniversary um so the movie was based on the 1964 novel charlie and the chocolate factory and the 1971 movie tells the story of the um inset uh inset, i can't say the word I'm not sure. I'm not reading your Okay. Script. Anyway, uh, the tells the story of about Willy Wonka, who is played by Gene Wilder. Who Eccentric. In, thank you. Uh, who invites a group of golden ticket winner winning children to his secretive chocolate factory. 
Cole, who played Veruca Salt, described Wilder as a kind, war- uh, warm, kind person with piercing blue eyes. Um, Cole, who said that she was actually the only kid in Germany that didn't have a member of her family on set, recalled how Wilder found out that she was unaccompanied a few weeks into filming. Uh, the movie was primarily shot in Munich, Germany. So according to Cole, her mother was away working in England, and the then 12-year-old uh, actress uh, was basically on her old on her own while they were in Germany uh, with just a registered chaperone. Uh, Cole had said that when Wilder learned that she was on her own, he ended up telling Roy Kinnear, who played her on-screen father, um, Jack Albertson, who played Charlie's grandpa Joe. He said, look, boys, she's on her own here. We got to look out for her. And that's what they did. They took care of her, she said. Um, you know, that was just so Gene. He was very much looking around at what was going on and taking care of everybody else. He was a very kind man. Um, Bowler, uh, Bol- Bolner, sorry, uh, also recalled a funny interview experience that he'd had with a German newspaper. He said, you know, Gene doesn't speak German. I don't speak English very well. And the newspaper girl didn't speak English at all. Um, so Gene was just very gentle and very nice to all of us. And he tried to make the best of the situation. Um, since Willy Wonka, the movie was released in 1971, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory has been remade into musicals, video games, and then obviously the 2005 Tim Burton movie uh, starring Johnny Demp. Most recently, Deadline had reported in May that they were set to come out with an upcoming uh, Warner Brothers movie that was going to be uh, dealing with his life before The Chocolate Factory. So the prequel is actually tentatively slated to be released in 2023, according to Deadline. Uh, Peter Ostrom, who had played uh, Charlie Bucket, uh, told the insider that he was excited about the peak role. Uh, the prequel, whoo, can't talk. Uh, he said, you know, that it would kind of be nice to find out what happened to Willy Wonka prior to m- me meeting him. So all the references or anything new that they could do, uh, can still be with Willy Wonka as a positive. Um, and then Paris, who played Mike TV, agreed uh, and said that he'd even be open to making a cameo uh, in the prequel if people wanted him to. He said, I think it's nice for them that they're not doing a remake. Uh, they're doing a prequel because it's a way to avoid a direct comparison, especially in the area of Gene Wilder. That might always be a good thing because he was just so wonderful in our version of the film. Yeah, I think that was a that was a nice turn, and I don't think it comes as a surprise to anybody, right? Um, how they describe Gene Wilder here, mm-hmm. because it reflects pretty much every other interview or description I've ever seen about mm-hmm. the man was that he was just a kind, mm-hmm. gentle, and caring individual who was always looking out for his co-stars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was a nice thing, especially with the fiftieth the anniversary mm-hmm. coming along. So we'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is actually kind of a twofer. Um so they're both based on the same topic. And it happens to be Halston. Uh, so first, uh, there is the Netflix show that just released uh, about a month or so ago, a uh, five episode limited run series, uh, which is actually based on uh, a book that was written about the fashion designer. And then what was funny was after I watched the series, I ended up finding on Amazon Prime a documentary of Halston that was kind of done as a documentary but also um with like a little twist because some of the um people involved weren't alive anymore or weren't available for interviews so they had like some actors so you know part of that was kind of cheesy in in that um but what's interesting is that between watching the the um the series and also the documentary there were a lot of 
uh, things that were very similar. Uh, you know, there there were a couple of things, obviously, that the documentary showed that the television series didn't show, and then you know, vice versa. Excuse me. So, if you don't know Halston, or you know, not into the fashion industry, which I'm sure you're not, oh, I totally am. <laughs> so his name built an empire. His style defined an era. Uh, American fashion designer Halston skyrockets to fame before his life starts to spin out of control. Um, so it, it shows how, um, you know, he kind of started off, um, you know, he, he was born and raised in Iowa and left and, and went to New York City and was actually a hat designer. And how he kind of came to fame was he had designed uh, Jackie Kennedy's pillbox hat. And as soon as everybody saw her wearing that, that's when everybody knew who Halston was. And then unfortunately, within a couple of years, women stopped wearing hats. So it was like, well, now what do I do? And he kind of went through the whole fashion line of, of different things. And what was very interesting was they showed it in the documentary is that he would just take a piece of fabric and just kind of make all these weird cuts and that became a dress or an outfit where most fashion uh you know designers you know would cut this and sew this together and sew this together and you'd have all these different pieces where he was kind of known for like the one piece of material that maybe just had one seam on it you know he would just kind of look at something and just kind of know instinctively like it was almost like it was a piece of art uh you know for him so you know the show goes through um you know his his heyday and then the whole time of uh studio 54 and all the partying and you know he and and liza minnelli actually became like the best of friends and and basically up until um you know his his, his passing they were still very close um and you know just kind of sad to see you know the his his creativity kind of come you know crashing down um but very interesting and and you know the the one thing you know you you get to see a lot of corporate america in this because he basically you know signs this you know billion dollar deal um you know to have this company kind of come in and and help take over and in the end, he basically loses the right to his own name. Um, they basically hire these other fashion designers to create for Halston. You know, it's Halston by somebody else. And even to this day, you can go out and buy a Halston outfit that obviously it's just under that name. Now it's just a corporate name, uh, you know, but again, very interesting. And like I said, if you end up watching the show and you want to have a little bit more factual information, you can go and watch uh, on Amazon Prime as well. All right. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is a departure from my typical documentary picks. And it is the movie The Tomorrow War, War on Amazon Prime. In the Tomorrow War, the world is stunned when a group of time travelers arrive from the year 2051 to deliver an urgent message. Thirty years in the future, mankind is losing a global war against a deadly alien species. The only hope for survival is for soldiers and civilians from the present to be transported to the future and join the fight. Among those recruited is a high school teacher and family man, Dan Forrester, played by Chris Pratt. Determined to save the world for his young daughter, Dan teams up with a brilliant scientist and his estranged father in a desperate quest to rewrite the fate of the planet. The premise of the movie is somewhat unique. Uh, a mix of Alien, Independence Day, and a bit of Terminator mixed in for a unique take on time, uh, on time traveling world-ending alien invasions. Uh, the character development is predictable and rushed with early scenes that are supposed to establish certain relationship dynamics that are almost completely forgotten later in the movie when they were supposed to be critical. 
As always, Chris Pratt does a fantastic job of playing Chris Pratt. Uh, much like Nicolas Cage, Chris Pratt plays himself in just about every role I've ever seen him in. Once again, showing his stunning lack of depth as an actor. You get the same personality traits, the same quirky comments, the same goofy facial expressions, and the typical befuddled look in more scenes than is needed from Pratt. Despite his lack of screen time in the movie, J.K. Simmons steals the show with his portrayal of Pratt's on-screen mercenary father. The story progresses to a natural conclusion, only to have a bit of today's political strife injected into the plot to supply us with an unneeded 45 additional minutes to a movie that should have ended on a high note. The last few scenes of the movie, set, the present time, set in the present time, are even less believable than soldiers from the future returning to the past to recruit everyday citizens as a sacrifice to an unbeatable enemy. Somehow, in all the twists and turns, the writers neglected to think about sending scientists into the past to come up with a very, the very solution to the problem that Pratt's character is sent to the future to work on as a last desperate measure. Big plot hole there. Mm. Uh, up until the last present day plot twist, the movie was entertaining just before it went off the rails and turned into a bad remake of John Carpenter's The Thing. If you turn the movie off at the instant that Pratt's character is transported back to the present day, you'll probably find it a much more enjoyable experience than watching it to its boorish conclusion. One good thing about the terrible ending, J.K. Simmons gets the bulk of the screen time here. Mm. So it's not a <clears throat> terrible movie. Uh, I didn't walk out of the home theater <laughs> uh, wishing to have that you know two hours of my life back. Um, but... Eh, I've seen better movies, and it could have been done better. But if you have Amazon Prime, it's free. So it's definitely worth the price of admission. <laughs> Bring your own snacks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for me. That's the Tomorrow War currently streaming on Amazon Prime. We'll be right back. So afterthoughts. What do we have for afterthoughts? So we're just going to plug, what was it, the the next three months worth right. of, of things? Because uh, the list, fortunately, is, is growing. So that's kind of a good thing. Uh, so coming up uh, in uh, 10 days, actually, is one of our favorites. ZoloCon. <laughs> and that'll be on Saturday, July 17th uh, from 10 to 6. Uh, and also July 18th, also from 10 to 6. And that one is at uh, the Fuge. The Fuge. The Fuge, uh, which is in Warminster, Pennsylvania. Um, again, it's one of our favorites, not only for um, for the the merchandise, but really it's the venue. That's what, you know, I think it's what, five or 10 bucks to, to get in. It's a relatively inexpensive one. Uh, toy show. Um, they have uh, various artists there selling their stuff. They have a couple of cosplayers. You can come dressed up if you want. Um, but again, it's the location that's that's really cool. Then, of course, we have Monster Mania. Uh, you have the three different dates. You have the August 13th through 15th in Cherry Hill, September 24th through the 26th in Hunt Valley, Maryland, and October 22nd to the 24th in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Uh, then another one that popped up, which is part of uh, toyshows.org, uh, is the Carnival of Collectibles, which is a free toy show that'll be Saturday, September 11th in Sicklerville. Uh, and then RetroCon, which will be two weeks later, um, September 25th through the 26th. And that is going to be at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks as well. And I think that's it, right? We've I think got, that is. We've got a bunch more lined up. We're going to show them to you gradually as we get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's looking promising. Mm -hmm. Looking promising. Before we go, uh, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get the audio version of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. The video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we would also invite you to uh, reach out to us, tell us how we're doing, give us your feedback. You can email us 
at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at <laughs> facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at insights into things. Audio versions of this podcast can be found on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find all the video versions of our podcasts at youtube.com backslash insights into things. You can find us streaming five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch Prime monthly subscription. We'd appreciate your support there. And if you missed any of our links, uh, you can go to our main Main website to find our bios as well at insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.